Recently, we explored what makes a sequel ideal. I believe Prime 2 embodies this philosophy, but what about the opposite? When does a sequel fail? What is the price of accessibility? Prime 3 released around a year after the Nintendo Wii hit store shelves. It was developed with the express intent to take full advantage of the Wii Remote's unique capabilities. We already know how well this works in the trilogy re-release, but before Prime 3, the GameCube control scheme was the norm. The idea of motion-controlled aiming was no doubt revolutionary at the time, and was most likely meant to be a huge selling point for the Wii. I see no better way to show off the Wii's capabilities than by demoing Metroid Prime's improved aiming control, which many of Nintendo's employees at the time thought would reinvent the control scheme for a first-person shooter. I have a bit of a theory when it comes to corruption, one that will ultimately form as the thesis for this video. Seeing as it was meant to take full advantage of the Wiimote and Nunchuck, and was intended to release as a launch title, I'm willing to bet Nintendo wanted this game to be more accessible than any Metroid game before it. Think about Nintendo's focus when the Wii launched. Games like Wii Sports were almost tech demos to sell people on the idea of motion controls, which at the time was a freshly minted idea. Twilight Princess and Prime 3 seemed like they would fulfill the same function, but for their established franchises. Twilight Princess used motion controls for aiming, sword swinging, and other actions, while Metroid followed more or less the same format. Except, Twilight Princess was built from the ground up with the GameCube in mind, whereas Prime 3 is seemingly built with the hardware as a basis. What does this mean for the game, outside of aiming? Pulling levers, typing on keypads, pumping generators, waggling free of enemies, and a whole host of gimmicky utilities, mostly revolving around the grapple lasso. On the surface, stuff like this may seem harmless. After all, it's only a few actions mapped to motion controls, and if the aiming is all the better for it, why complain? I agree, but I bring them up because it helps to possibly explain why I believe Prime 3 to be the most accessible game in the franchise. It isn't because of the motion controls, it's more a circumstance of Prime 3's release date and platform. Prime 3 shakes up the core of Metroid in quite a few areas, I posit, in an effort to appeal to a wider audience, the Nintendo Wii audience. Case in point, the narrative is far more hands-on than any Metroid game released up to that point. Before Other M hit the scene, Prime 3 had the most dialogue of any Metroid game, and it was the first time that dialogue was voice acted. Thankfully, Samus doesn't talk, but everyone else around her does. From the Galactic Federation troopers, to the head of the Galactic Federation, to the other bounty hunters, to the fucking Aurora unit. I was fine with the dialogue in Echoes because it was sparse and did a pretty good job establishing the Luminoth as a race worth saving, simply because you can see that they exist waiting to be saved. With Corruption, it's a double-edged sword. I love the other bounty hunters, because it both expands the world of Metroid while retaining Samus' status throughout the galaxy. Federation troopers will comment on your feats in the previous Prime games, and you get a sense that Samus has the respect of absolutely everyone. I have no problem with this slightly more drawn-out opening, because it shows us something we've never really seen before. Samus accepting a mission from the Galactic Federation. Other games were content to have Samus take up a mission before the game starts, which is a fine way to do it, but I appreciate that Prime 3 shows us that process. There's a sense of build-up with the other bounty hunters to be paid off later when Samus has to execute them, and it furthers the intense rivalry between Samus and Dark Samus, making for one of the most meaningful final battles in the franchise. You can really tell Samus cared for her fellow bounty hunters in scenes like this. On the same token, there are elements of the story that insult Samus' intelligence. Namely, the fucking Aurora unit. The Luminoth in Prime 2 did tell Samus what she was doing, but only in between areas, and only once. In Corruption, it feels like Samus is being told what to do every five seconds. Seriously, hearing the phrase travel to another planet for an essential upgrade really puts into context just how crazy it is to make players leave an area midway. Samus. Perhaps what you require to access the Federation landing site in the east is not on this planet. 
The item you need may reside on a world you have previously visited. While I appreciate the presence of the Galactic Federation in the beginning, they feel really out of place when you travel to the Space Pirate homeworld. The Galactic Federation want to raise hell on these bastards, but you need to go in there and disable their defense systems first. When you're at the end of this segment, you'll need to protect 12 bomb troopers who are supposed to open the way to the Leviathan Seed embedded in the planet. Seems well and good, I just have one question. What fucking good do the troopers serve in this situation? Their one use is to blow up a door. Is Samus incapable of doing this herself? Could she not have found a way in alone and save the lives of the troopers in the process? Why is Samus even here if she can't handle this herself? This is the motherfucker who eradicated an entire dimension of hostile aliens, blew up two planets, and will soon blow up another all by herself. She's not even looking to destroy the pirate homeworld, she's sneaking in to destroy the Leviathan Seed. You could argue she needed the help to enter planet phase unnoticed, and fine, I'll give you that. At least in that situation, there's a reason for Samus to be there, but on the pirate homeworld, it doesn't make any sense. Supposedly, the troopers need Samus's protection, but if they need Samus's protection, it raises the question, what can the bomb troopers do that Samus can't do? While the power bomb isn't in this game, it's crazy to have players expect that Samus can't just bomb her way through with her goddamn power bomb because it was in the other Metroid games. She conveniently doesn't have it now? Please. Regardless, my major gripe is the Aurora unit, and while you can turn off hints, it doesn't stop the Aurora unit from talking to you, it only disables map notifications. There's an overall radical shift in tone from Prime 1 to Echoes moving into Corruption. The first two games were darker, more isolated experiences on alien planets. Samus only had herself and the occasional guidance of the Luminoth to help her. This rings true for every single Metroid game except for Fusion, though Fusion had other elements going for it like the terror of the SAX. Prime 3 is almost… leisurely in its tone. There's a sense of urgency, sure, the stakes are personal with the corruption of the bounty hunters and the Phazon infected space pirates are a real threat. It just feels too focused on delivering an action-packed narrative. Take the sequence on Norian. This stuff is absolutely unheard of in a Metroid game. You're running around with Federation troopers and bounty hunters fighting off the space pirates together as the game jumps from cutscene to cutscene, attempting to build up each of the bounty hunters so you'll feel for them during their boss fights. As I said, I enjoy the bounty hunters for this reason, but this type of narrative delivery doesn't even feel like Metroid. It feels like Halo. It makes for a fitting wrap-up to the phase on thematic trilogy, it just decides to tell a more traditional narrative to conclude this narrative arc. I think it'd be cool if Planet Phase was the planet you were stuck on. They could easily touch the planet up to make it look less ubiquitous all around, and there'd be more of a point to Samus being corrupted throughout the game. She only gets more corrupted after destroying a Leviathan Seed boss. Wouldn't it make more sense for her to be continually corrupted based on how long she's on the Phase homeworld? It's so easy to set this up. The Federation locate Planet Phase and recognize it as a major threat to the galaxy, so Samus is sent to infiltrate and destroy. This both concludes the thematic arc of the trilogy while retaining Metroid's unique atmosphere and narrative delivery. However, this isn't like other Metroid games. You can just go wherever at the drop of a hat, and people will keep telling you where you're supposed to go, almost like you have a support group at your beck and call. The strength of Samus' character is partly drawn from the fact that she's always alone, so most of her incredible feats are attributed directly to her. She didn't have help on Zebes or SR388 or Talon 4, she handled those situations all on her own. The idea that you'll be traveling to tons of different planets serves primarily an aesthetic function. It means we get beautiful vistas above the clouds in Elysia, or the crags of Brio, or the acidic climate of the pirate homeworld, or even the Federation outpost on Norian. I'm not arguing with diversity, it's quite welcome, it just doesn't fit as well as it did in Echoes. It certainly makes sense, but you sacrifice many story and gameplay elements by choosing to prioritize the environment design. As much as I appreciate the diversity, I'd rather have that sense of isolation and seamless gameplay flow other Metroid games offered. Hell, even Fusion handled this better, keeping everything contained within one space station, but segmenting the different areas into pods. Instead, Corruption has further segmented the level design in a format similar to Echoes, but without any of the nuance. Aether was interconnected, but it strategically placed the areas in a ring to cut down on excessive backtracking and keep key areas close to one another. Prime 3 somehow takes the worst of both worlds by adopting the sometimes linear level design of Prime 1 and segmenting it into three areas of any given planet. 
The kicker is that the areas must be entered via your ship, which you can only enter wherever you parked it. If Prime is a set of areas jumbled together and Echoes is a modular ring, Corruption is a random assortment of disconnected rooms all bridged together by your ship. The effect isn't ideal. Samus's ship has never been the focal point of any Metroid game. It just sits at your entry point onto the planet and you can return for a free energy recharge. Prime 3 decides you can use your ship to travel between planets, land in various sections of said planet, and decimate enemies and objects with powerful missiles. A progression key in another new flavor. Unfortunately, it's a flavor that feels unjustified. What does a focus on Samus's ship add more than it takes away? Point at specified areas in your ship visor and press a button. It feels even more comical that Samus's ship is so weak that you need to power it up throughout the game, rather than having her ship be fit for combat at the start. You'd think the Federation would supply Samus's ship with state-of-the-art missile launchers, but you need to head to Brio for the damn things. Complain all you will about Samus's abilities and suit upgrades changing on a whim, this stuff is a bit too far for me, and I wouldn't have as big of an issue if the ship wasn't already taking so much away from the atmosphere and level design. If, say, the ship was a means of traveling from one point of the planet to another, maybe I'd be less harsh on it. At that point, the ship would be no different from the many elevators in Prime 1 and 2. Traveling to different planets is a whole nother ball game, breaking otherwise harmless linear level design. Each area is built the same as any other Metroid game in theory, a path with secrets hidden along it, and shortcuts to different sections of said area. This design largely works because Samus can land her ship in various areas. If we look at a map of Brio, there are four ship landing sites, placed strategically so you'll never be too far off from your ship to travel. There is one self-contained linear section with only one landing zone, but this area was built with a shortcut at the end which takes you right back to your ship. Brio is expertly built in this respect, but my problems stem from the two other areas, which are only technically linked by the Machine Works bridge. You can't do anything with this bridge until much later, so to travel between these sections of Brio, you've got to use the landing sites. One of them is two landing sites, which is quite welcome, but the other only has one. This means that backtracking is repetitive, seeing as you're walking through glorified hallways. This problem magnifies in Skytown, where progression takes an eternity. There are only two ship landing sites in the first section, and one in the second section. They're as far away from each other as they possibly could be, and the location of the objectives in Skytown leads to a bunch of crisscrossing through a giant map, back and forth, side to side. The boss fight against Gore is all the way at your first landing site, and you don't start fighting Gore until you've traveled all the way to the other end of Skytown. You know what that means? Traveling through a bunch of cannons and grapple hook segments until you finally make it back to Gore. And after you dispatch him, you need to make it all the way back to the Aurora unit you were just at. Things perk up once you unlock the additional landing sites, but near the end, you have to do even more traveling to collect the pieces of a giant bomb. There's a bomb piece right next to the first landing site, so you have to travel all the way back again. There's just too much exploration of this area that has a bunch of gigantic linear hallways with repetitive grapple hook rides and cannons, which are all fun the first time, but lose their luster after you've used them five. It's a shame the most beautiful area in the game is such a convoluted mess. Thankfully, I think this is the worst it ever gets. The ship doesn't ruin progression so much as it harms progression. This is especially true when you're forced to travel to another fucking planet for an upgrade. This disconnected room setup works much better on the pirate homeworld, because the design of the pirate homeworld is so closely linked to the design of the areas in Echoes. There are trolleys underground you can use to link the separate areas of the planet together, so you don't need to enter your ship very often. Though each room is technically disparate, they're all linked together indirectly. The room layouts aren't as linear, instead relying on branching paths that stretch outward from a central point. This means you don't backtrack a hell of a lot. You lose that element of confusion from Echoes and even Prime 1, but it does minimize repetition. You can tell Corruption was focusing less on being a Metroid game and more on being a first-person shooter. Collection and backtracking are still staples, but it focuses on combat first and foremost, which I can't say was true for the other Prime games. There was always an element of combat, and it worked well enough, but I don't think it's the strong suit of the Prime trilogy. I flock to them for puzzle solving and item collecting, as well as exploration through a distinct atmosphere. Corruption lacks that ambiance and modular level design, focusing instead on the Wii's revolutionary aiming. Refer back to the theory I mentioned near the start of the video. Retro built this game to take full advantage of the Wii. 
Looking at this game through that lens, a lot of the changes make more sense. Arrow mines, for instance, scream motion aiming gimmick. They're a collection of mines that advance toward you slowly, and each of them have shields. One of the shields will lower every time you kill a mine. You basically just point, click, kill, repeat. Shield troopers require you swing the nunchuck to rip their shields away, leaving them vulnerable. They litter doors and hallways with debris, forcing you to rip it all away with your grapple lasso. There are floating objects on the grapple rides in Skytown you need to shoot down before they throw you off the ride. Many of the boss fights require you point and shoot at special, sometimes shiny objects to expose their weak point. Or, my favorite, use the grapple lasso for literally every fucking boss fight. Or so it seems. As I mentioned, this stuff is inoffensive, but it's also pointless in many cases. What do the arrow mines really contribute to a fight? What does ripping debris away do for the game? It's just another clunky way to progress from area to area, all meant to get you using the Wiimote and Nunchuck's unique technology. This is why the game focuses so much more on combat and other motion control related scenarios. That's what this game was built for, after all. To be an accessible first person shooter that demos the Wii's unique technology. Funny, then, that Metroid Prime was never a first person shooter first, it was a first person adventure. Samus' shots are projectile-based, and without that precision lock-on, hitting your targets is cumbersome. You need a significant lead time on jumpier enemies, and they move far too often for it to be accurate. They're as aggressive as any of the other Prime games, they're just harder to hit, so the lock-on becomes less of a crutch and more of a method to move the camera. The problem is that in any other first-person shooter, the camera is directly linked to the cursor. In Corruption, the motion control is much better than the GameCube control, but there were limitations Retro may not have been expecting with the camera. Trying to aim precisely can be a nightmare when a boss's lock-on location is too far above what you're trying to shoot, in the case of the Metroid Hatcher. Fighting it is very disorienting because the tentacles don't have lock-on spots. Thus, you're either forced to stop locking on, making it easier to hit the tentacles but harder to track the boss itself, or lock onto the boss, making it easier to track the boss, but harder to track the tentacles. Compare this control scheme to a game like Halo, where the aiming and camera control are intrinsically linked, and you'll spot the differences in precision quite easily. Bullets in Halo are mostly hitscan as well, meaning that the moment you fire the weapon, the bullet will have already hit the enemy you're targeting. Some weapons like the rocket launcher have travel time, but the majority of weapons are hitscan. Corruption doesn't have any hitscan weaponry. In fact, none of the Prime games do. It only seems like Prime 1 and 2 have hitscan because the projectiles home in on enemies you're locked onto. Corruption suffers in fights where precision aiming is required, because the travel time is significant enough to miss quite spectacularly. I would say to turn off lock on free aim, but it doesn't help during boss fights with weak points that you can't target. It also means that while locked on, you can't freely aim, and that can help with certain lock-on points that act more as a camera positioner than a precise target. What I'm getting at here is that there's no perfect solution to this dilemma, and I think it shows that the Prime games are action games second and adventure games first. There's no problem with focusing on the action-y aspects of the game more, but you need to design the game like a shooter. Add in some hitscan weapons and leave the projectile-based weapons to stuff like the missiles, which are supposed to be more powerful. There's another point, there really aren't enough weapons to give the combat the same spice as other shooters. One of my favorite things about the new Doom is how many weapons you have access to as the game progresses. You go from a dinky pistol to an assault rifle, a rocket launcher, a plasma rifle, a shotgun, and you can customize each weapon with upgrade points. Prime 3 finally combines the beam upgrades, but ironically I think it would have been much better with multiple beams. Think about it, Corruption wants to be more like a shooter, so wouldn't it be cool to have different weapons? I know people didn't like ammunition, but that's mostly because Echoes wasn't designed to be a shooter first and foremost, so it was a bit jarring. As much as I enjoy the ammo system in Prime 2, it makes so much more sense to have it in Corruption, as that would incentivize use of different weapons should the game have had different weapons. You could have more substantial evolutions of your arm cannon. Maybe the plasma beam morphs your arm cannon into a different shape, and the same thing could happen with the Nova Beam. I mean, I'm not a designer, so I don't know what it would turn into, but that would be really dope. The weapons could have been balanced by ammo count, or by effectiveness against specific enemies. Either would work well to incentivize use of different weapons. As it stands, your options for attack are only to use your beam or your missiles. Super missiles are absent in Prime 3, another instance where they would have worked incredibly well, but they decided to scrap them for... whatever reason. I mean, of course, grapple voltage is a worthy replacement for stuff like the power bomb and super missiles, right? 
Super riveting gameplay here, just hold the stick up or down to transfer energy. Oh man, you also just need that hyper grapple to destroy four or five dedicated hyper grapple objects by holding up on the nunchuck. Brilliant. The Prime games have consistently been designed for you to focus on avoiding bullets rather than shooting them yourself. Enemy designs definitely suffer because of this change in focus, but they worked well in the previous games because, as I said, it was more about avoiding their bullets. The Space Pirates are the only real threats to your well-being, because they attempt to trick you with their bullet path, simultaneously jumping and teleporting around the room. Again, this wasn't much of an issue in Prime 1 and 2 because they had great puzzles, great dungeon design, and you got lost exploring it all. Prime 3 doesn't have as strong of an adventure, so it's forced to lay on the crutch that is the combat. As a result, these enemies kinda crumble under the weight of it all. I mean, the Space Pirates have always been the best type of enemies, but other staple enemies like the Bats or Wall Crawlers are pushovers. Look at these Tin Man enemies, they just stand in formation waiting for you to melt them, slowly shooting every 5 seconds. Just as enemies in the 2D Metroid games were more obstacles than they were challenges, the enemies in Prime 1 and 2 were usually more obstacles, though some of the enemies could be quite challenging. Corruption has a few challenging regular fights, and only a few challenging boss fights, thanks to a feature called Hyper Mode. You'd think Hyper Mode would allow for some more combat options, but in reality, Hyper Mode is basically THE combat option. It functions like a god mode in a spectacle fighter, powering you up substantially. Except, Hyper Mode can be accessed at any time at the cost of draining your health. You can stay in Hyper Mode as long as you have the energy on the top bar, but eventually you'll be stuck in Hyper Mode and you'll need to use all of your phase on to exit. On paper, it's a neat risk versus reward scenario, forcing you to choose between health or power. In execution, Hyper Mode doesn't have any drawbacks. Enemies and breakable objects drop an astronomical amount of energy on veteran difficulty, meaning that after using Hyper Mode for any prolonged amount of time, you can quickly get that energy back. Even in boss fights, they drop a bunch of energy after you get them down to a set increment of health, ensuring you can spam Hyper Mode and end fights within minutes. Plus, if you manually exit Hyper Mode, you can retain your unused energy. The winning strategy? Enter Hyper Mode, get off a few quick shots, then exit. Your health loss will be extremely minimal, and you make it back as quickly as you lost it. Imagine, if you will, Devil Trigger from Devil May Cry was an infinite use ability. The bar was always full. This would be very bad, because the game is deliberately paced around Dante's base strength, and it depends on Devil Trigger being used infrequently. Hyper Mode, meanwhile, was apparently an afterthought. Prime 3 was worked on mostly by Retro, but there was another team at Nintendo helping out. This separate team suggested Hyper Mode be implemented, and it was only implemented after being made an optional mode, since Retro were initially hesitant it would offer anything substantial gameplay-wise. I think Retro were right, because it really doesn't offer anything more than making the game painfully easy. I mean, the boss fights in Corruption aren't majestic or anything, but they're certainly above the bosses in Prime 1 when you're just fighting with your base power. Hyper Mode then fucking decimates bosses, and it's hard to think the game was really designed around that power increase, especially because it's so easily abused. Pair this broken god mode with uninteresting enemy AI, and you can imagine why Corruption is such a weak shooter. I guess Corruption wasn't really designed to be a shooter. Maybe it was designed to be a bastardized hybrid between Metroid and a traditional first-person shooter, lacking the nuance of both. Look at any level from Halo and compare everything about it. The game is harder due to the enemies doing more damage to you, there are different tiers of enemies with different levels of effectiveness, grunts are weak alone but deadly in numbers, jackals are similarly easy to kill but often do a lot of damage, and elites are all around tough to kill. Hunters are sparse, but they're incredibly deadly. The level design is based around giving you multiple weapons and vantage points to choose from during a firefight, and each firefight is paced very well. There are just the right amount of enemies, so you're quickly moving from one firefight to the next, each distinct in their level design and enemy placement. It also handles difficulty even better than any of the Prime games, because it's not just a health modifier. On Legendary, the game will actually swap out enemies for higher level elites or other more powerful enemies, and although you take more damage, the enemies don't. 
You're more fragile, which promotes caution, but the pace isn't halted like it is on higher difficulties in the Prime games, where bosses get huge health bars and become walking chores. I can do this same comparison with Prime 2 or any of the other Metroid games. Prime 2 has that unique Metroid atmosphere and a focus on modular, sometimes confusing level design. The power-ups were both meaningful and keys to progression, giving the spider ball more unique level design to work with and giving the screw attack a somewhat less situational function. Boss fights were huge and multi-phased, none of them were unnecessarily repetitive. Prime 3 has Ridley, who does the same damn thing he does in Prime 1, flying around forcing you to wait for him to land. The other bosses are certainly unique and take less time to kill, but their phases certainly aren't. Prime 2 is a better adventure game, and Halo is a better first-person shooter. Corruption is left squabbling somewhere in the middle. It's the easiest, most accessible Metroid game next to Fusion, and at least Fusion is pretty difficult. It's easy to get around, it's easy to beat the bosses and regular enemies, it's easy to get full completion. There's literally an area in Skytown where you can download the location of every secret, something you certainly cannot do in the other Prime games. It's similar to the Square and Circle system in Zero Mission and Fusion, but even those games had hidden rooms that didn't appear on the map until you found them. Corruption has every secret location revealed on the map, it's wild. This accessibility doesn't always come with a negative price. For instance, let's look at the energy cells. This game's version of the endgame MacGuffin hunt. Metro thought we really loved them the last two times, <laughs> though this time it's handled very well, at least relatively. There are nine energy cells, and get this, you only need five. Most, if not all of those energy cells, by the way, are gotten on the linear pathway. You'll be exploring the pirate homeworld and you'll almost be forced to take out an energy cell. It's pretty great. This means four of the energy cells are for optional upgrades. I guess Retro really did listen to me. I mean, if those videos had been released before 2007, that is. They're not amazing upgrades, it's mostly just energy tanks and missile expansions. But it's a start. Hopefully, Prime 4 will learn from Prime 3 and make the endgame MacGuffin hunt more substantial. Maybe an armor upgrade or a beam weapon upgrade. From the looks of things, Prime 3 is setting up a bright future in that regard. While the explanations for these shifts in gameplay can be debated to hell and back, the shifts still happened and they're quite radical. Despite Prime 3 functioning like a Metroid game with puzzles and item-based progression, with frequent backtracking, memorable boss fights, fantastic music, it lacks the soul of a great Metroid game, and it tries to make up for it by being a compelling shooter instead. Yet, it also lacks the soul of a great shooter, with a limited offensive selection, shoddy aiming and camera marriage, and an abusable god mode. It doesn't have that sense of isolation Metroid accomplishes so well, you lose that interconnected feel of exploring a planet, but I can't say it's all bad. You do still get the thrill of watching Samus grow from area to area, the thrill of hunting for secrets once you get a new power-up, the thrill of well-designed boss battles, as well as regular enemies. This is Metroid, it's just not the best example of it. It's the narrative conclusion to a trilogy I enjoy, and it's a serviceable core Metroid title, much more so than a game like Other M or Federation Force. That's why I'll continue to replay it. This trilogy works best when you're playing each game back to back. It's a bit of a shoddy quality scale, but progressing from Talon 4 to Aether to, well, all the planets of Prime 3 is satisfying. Finally destroying Dark Samus, built up in both Echoes and Corruption, and ending with a thumbs up from Samus, and a scene where she hangs around in Skytown, likely mourning her fellow bounty hunters. Prime 4 was announced this E3, and I hope this series of videos serves as a proper design document in terms of what to focus on and refine for a new Metroid game. We're done with Phazon, so ideally we can move to a new threat, possibly setting up for a new trilogy? There will no doubt be options for Gyro and Dual Analog, a focus on being a first-person adventure rather than a first-person shooter, and implementing that trademark Metroid atmosphere. I just hope they take more calls from Echoes than from Corruption. Until my eventual video on Prime 4, that concludes my analysis of Prime 3 Corruption. If you liked the video, I have a Patreon you can donate to if you'd like to keep me fed and making videos consistently. 
If you don't have the money, please don't donate. My videos will always be here. You can comment, like, dislike, whatever you want to do. I value discussion, so let's open a dialogue. I hope you enjoyed. My name has been King K, and I certainly hope you have some well-deserved fun today.